Hello and welcome to season two of Saturn Returns with Kagi. The aim of this podcast is to bring clarity during transitional times where there can be confusion and doubt. I am very excited to get into the first episode, but firstly, I just wanted to say that I am very grateful to all of you who have listened in and shared this podcast with your friends or colleagues. It would seem that the themes we discuss on this podcast have resonated with many of you. And actually through sharing this experience myself, I must admit, I feel less alone. And so I decided to create a Saturn Returns with Kagi Patreon page where I can share content, thoughts, musings, and we can create a space together where we can have open conversations in a safe and cohesive space. I was building businesses, creating successful podcasts, and I was on TV show, getting TV show offers, all these different things, and I wasn't happy. But having good friendships, and be able to sit with you now and just feel so totally at ease, having a great relationship with my girlfriend, parents, all that kind of stuff, and now I'm happy. For me, it's about being loved and feeling loved and being like a, this sort of place. I am so thrilled that for the first episode of season two, I am joined by a very, very special person. Now, many of you will recognize his voice. He is one of the originals and the longest standing member of TV show Made in Chelsea. In fact, I can't believe he's still on it. Founder of the successful sweet company Candy Kittens, co-host of the Private Parts podcast. And if that wasn't impressive enough, he is about to appear as a contestant on Strictly Come Dancing. But first and foremost, Jamie Lane is one of my oldest and dearest friends. We have known each other since we were 15. Jamie has always been this fun-loving, exuberant character. And I guess it's safe to say that he's a natural-born entertainer. But as you will hear from this conversation, I think that the pressures he felt to perform all the time became, you know, somewhat of a burden to him. And I think this is a really powerful conversation because once I explain what Saturn Return means and how it affects us, he has this sort of aha moment. And he opens up about his own experiences and some of the hurdles he faced during this time. He discusses his mental health, his experience with depersonalization and anxiety, and how ultimately through these experiences, he has found what happiness is really about. Also, I wanted to introduce you to our astrological guide for the season. Saturn takes no prisoners. It's very confronting. Nora and I connected a couple of years ago through social media. I call her my personal spirit guide. So she's going to be explaining a bit about the astrological side of things, and we'll see how that parallels and connects with the conversations of our guests. So if you had a mental health issue that you were escaping, in many ways, you know, drugs, alcohol, travel, sex, Saturn will just confront you with that once more and make you show up, make you take care of yourself, make you take care of your mental health for the next 28 years to follow. Just the self-respect that you have to start giving yourself during that time, the boundaries that you have to set for yourself that automatically translate to others. So a lot of people who don't serve you will fall away out of your life. And that's a good thing. But during that time, it doesn't feel like that because you're already confronted with all of these issues and you're already not feeling good. So obviously, if all of these things happen and you already have an existing issue that you need to address, it will translate into, you can call it mental health, but you can just call it a dark night of the soul. And this is either, you know, live or die mentally. So I think you're going to like this conversation. We recorded it quite recently at Jamie's home in London. So please forgive the uh, screaming neighbours you can occasionally hear. We swear a little bit too. And the unprofessional mic knock by me. But, you know, it's a great conversation between two friends who ultimately just adore each other. So I hope you enjoy it. I have like few people in my life that I don't have to see or don't have to like connect with, but it's like that memory of like nostalgia thing when I was a kid, right? You're hundred percent one of them where it, it just feels totally normal and relaxed. Yeah. Like so much time could pass. Yeah. And it, and it doesn't matter. Yeah. And it doesn't matter. And I think that's, what's kind of great about, that's when you know what real friendships are because you have that. Ch- yeah. You have that like, 
childhood kind of friendship that never really goes, I don't think. I know. Because we, we first met when we were... Well, people will presume, listeners will presume it's like around me and Chelsea, but it predates that yeah. by, you know, several years. Yeah. But Jamie, welcome to the Saturn Returns podcast. Thank you. So I think this is going to be super interesting to get like a male perspective on some of the stuff that we started going into a second ago. Okay, can I ask though, with Saturn Returns, why the title? Okay, so during your Saturn Return, which happens towards the end of your 20s, it's when Saturn orbits the same place in the sky it occupied the time of your birth. So that takes about 30 years for, for it to do that transit. So with it, you're supposed to feel this like Saturnian energy about, you know, discipline, boundaries. And if you haven't been living your life authentically, it will kind of give you a couple of tests to force you to do so. You look terrified. No, because that's, that's, that's what happened to me. That's what happened to me. His face right now is like, oh, my God, everything's making so much sense. Holy yeah. smokes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, like, oh like relationships will just, like, fall apart overnight. Like, jobs won't work out. Like, friendships will change. And it's it's really tough, and it feels really individual and really personal. But it's something that you you have to go through. It's like a cosmic coming of age. Okay, listen, I'm going to be... This is some real shit. I swear to God. So, I, just to really talk about myself again. I... <laughs> yeah. Until I, I, yeah. Favorite subject. I love this. I'm really, I'm really going to this one. Um, until I was, like, 22, I was pretty sweet with, like, everything. I was very lucky. I had a, a family. We had divorced parents, whatever. But, you know, everything was pretty cool at home. Um, very privileged background. You know, went to boarding school, all this kind of thing, private school. Uh, everything was okay. I, I was happy all the time, never really felt sad, played a lot of sport, uh, was kind of popular, dated people, everything was all right. And then when I was like 22 years old, I started doing a TV, TV show made in Chelsea, or 23. Um, and that's when like things like dipped, right? Like things started to become a bit odd. Like I had panic attacks and all that. I mean, the, let's just be honest, the yeah. like structure of the show in itself was a bit odd. It wasn't exactly a stabilizing environment for anyone. No, I don't think, it, and I still don't think it is for anyone. And I think it takes a lot of, grit and determination and uh just bad habits to kind of stick around doing some a show like <laughs> bad that. Bad habits. <laughs> I think it does. Yeah, I think you have to really have a skewed way of life. <laughs> I'm still on it. I'm still <laughs> yeah. starting. Still here. Killing it. <laughs> but the biggest thing was is I remember when I was 27 years old, I had something called depersonalization, which was freaking awful. And what it is, it's basically your your body putting yourself into autopilot. So I was honestly sitting in a restaurant with our mutual friend Spencer Matthews. Um, <laughs> Maybe that'll send you that, over that the That'll send me over the edge, yeah. I was like, see ya. And we were sitting in a restaurant and suddenly it was like a cloud going over my eyes. Like I was like floating and I was like, what the hell is this? I was like, this is weird. It was like a click, honestly like a click. You feel like you're in a dream state. So it's very difficult to kind of understand what reality is and what isn't. So you'd wake up from sleeping and think you're still dreaming and stuff like this. And basically it's your body just saying, right, you've put your body under too much stress and strain. We need to Shut protect it down, your mind. We're going to shut down and put you in autopilot for a bit. <gasps> yeah, it was terrifying. And you I must have had no idea what was going on then. No fucking clue. And then six months later, I remember I was on holiday in Dubai, actually. And I was just sitting there with one of my ex-girlfriends. And um, it suddenly just clicked and my mind just went back to normal and the cloud just disappeared. Bizarre. But it was six months. Six months of hell. I think I was going mad every day. And oh also, I still had to do TV shows and all these different things and pretend I was okay and all that kind of stuff. Well, you've always had an amazing ability to, like, compartmentalise stuff like that. Like, not let it derail you and just keep functioning. Yeah. Because you're just, like, this energiser body. But perhaps that didn't always serve you if this is the case. That the you case, just, that's yeah. it. Like, going from, like, the most sociable person, I then had, like, bad social anxiety, and I would not go and see buddies as much because I'd be nervous that I wouldn't make the as fun for them or I wouldn't be as entertaining. And so, basically, every single person that I met who I knew, unless they were a stranger, um, was like an audition for myself. I'd, if I didn't make them laugh or have fun with them, I felt like I'd failed. That sounds exhausting. It's exhausting. Oh, my God. And then doing the TV uh, and performing all the time. Come on, let's be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Underneath it all. Like, no one would think that you and me are both, like, suffer from social anxiety. Yeah, but... but we I, both do. Well, we both do, yeah, but actually, weirdly enough, the only way that I got over that was exposing myself to situations where I had to go mm -hmm. and see people. Same. Oh, it was just death at the beginning. But then I used alcohol all the time. Well, I was just going to say, alcohol was a huge thing for me because I used that as a, like, okay, 
well, I can put on this mask by drinking and whatever, and that allows me to go out into the world and not be socially anxious. But of course, the anxiety would come tenfold, like days later. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What happened with me is that alcohol became the devil. Mm. And I was like, it's definitely alcohol that's making me feel anxious. It's gotta be because I'm drinking so much. So as I find, so then I stopped drinking completely. And when I stopped drinking, it actually made it worse because there was nothing, I wasn't masking. masking yeah, I wasn't um, self-medicating with anything. So actually all the anxieties and stuff came to the surface mm. even more. And so then what I had to do is I had to rebuild myself and understand myself much more. And that's a pretty hard process because it's basically like learning a new language. Mm. And you suddenly have to just redo everything. And how, what, talk to me about that process. Oh, it was awful. Kind of Did you have like the infrastructure of therapy and stuff like that. Helping. Yeah, but I was pretty fortunate because I could afford therapy mm -hmm. uh, and I still do therapy once a week and it's not cheap. Mm -hmm. You know, it's pretty difficult for a lot of people. So I was able to afford therapy every single week. Um, so for my girlfriend, she had to, you know, Sophie, poor Sophie, you know, she bought a contract into a guy who's, oh my God, hey, fun, la, la, all this kind of stuff. <laughs> and then suddenly it went from to this guy who wasn't drinking to like feeling horrifically anxious and just not really knowing what's going on. And she was like, well, I didn't buy into this. What and what, just in the context of time, when did this happen? This happened last November. Mm -hmm. So it started last November. And it started actually, but it started before that, actually. So, you know, 2019, I remember, I remember when it first really kicked in, I went, I was in Buenos Aires, so this must be in October time. And I remember staying in a hotel one night by myself. And I remember waking up the next morning and going for breakfast. And I remember I couldn't sit still. I was like, well, oh, what am I like? I couldn't sit still. And I was like, what the hell's wrong with me? Why can't I like fidget you trying to move? I was like, oh, I need to go on a walk or something. And I didn't understand what was going on. And it was all the warning signs for basically what, they said it's basically burnout in a sense, mm. is that you you have been masking yourself with alcohol for so long. You have all these demons going to the surface. You've been working so hard, burning candle at both ends, doing everything, putting on a front, putting on a face, trying to entertain everybody. And my body just went, you can't do this anymore. And the first warning was when I had depersonalization when I was 27, mm. but I ignored it. I just yeah. got through it and same bad habits came in. But I think that was somewhat was of my, rock, bottom, my rock bottom, yeah, where I felt pretty shitty and you're like i cannot carry on living oh, life this way. i was like, i just can't do this anymore i can't carry on you know being someone who's not picking up calls to people being socially anxious only going to events if i'm drunk you know all this different stuff and so i forced myself to change i um exercised a lot i forced myself to expose myself to situations that i didn't like whether that was talking to friends that i felt awkward to talk to whether it was going on one-on-one -on -one lunches with people, because I would never do that in a million really? years. Really? So yeah. that kind of stuff you couldn't know? Wouldn't do it. Why? Was it like the intimacy of it or something? Too intimate, yeah. yeah. I could do it with strangers, but I couldn't do it with close friends. <gasps> That's so fascinating. Yeah, yeah. And, go, and it, it, me saying that to people, they'd like, are you kidding me, you? Like, but why? Because I thought that I wouldn't be... I, I thought I would, ha I would have to entertain. Mm -hmm. I had done a reality show, I still have for 10 years, where every single scene I walk into, I, I have to make people laugh, I have to make it funny, I have to do those different things. Mm -hmm. I was the jester. So my job, my life, everything was just me being this crazy person all the time. So if I wasn't being that crazy person, I had conditioned myself to be that way. So me going to a one-on-one -on -one lunch, I was like, I'm just too exhausted. But was it a bit of a fear of like, if I'm not being that person, who am I? Yeah, exposed. And then you have, yeah. you, you're being exposed as the person that you, you you want people to think you are, but you're actually not. I, I remember I went, we have a great mutual friend called Max Fox Andrews, and I went on holiday with him to Greece. And this was last year, and I came back from Greece, and I went and saw my therapist I just started seeing. And she said, how was it? And I said, oh, it was tough because I felt like I had to entertain and I had to do this and I was drinking and God and all these different things. She said, well, what was your favorite moment? So my favorite moment was when I was playing backgammon with Max because we didn't have to talk and I could just play backgammon. Mm. She was like, well, those are the moments you have to remember that you, that you can be like that in situations people aren't going to judge you. Mm -hmm. And slowly by slowly, I went into situations where I didn't entertain as much and I didn't judge. And actually, you know what happened? People went, God, Jamie, you're on sweet form at the moment. And I was like, what? I said, yeah, you're just really great to hang out with. And it turns out me being the hectic guy that I was- <laughs> Was annoying the shit out of everyone. <laughs> so full on. Like, they were like, shut up, you know? Like, and also they knew that I was mm. acting and they knew that I was being this character. And they, cause they'd seen me before everything when I wasn't that person. 
um, because of my whole life and the things that I had done and the choices I'd given, I felt like I had to be this character. And so when I say I had to rewire myself, I had to realize that I could sit with people and actually it's okay to be well, quiet it's got, sometimes. A lot of things come, like what I'm hearing from this is, is a fear and inability to just be seen and to be like held yeah. in like who you are and not have to always like hold space for everyone else and be entertaining. It's like just to be mm. and for that to be okay. It seems like that was like a terrifying thought for you. Awful. And it, would, it was um, imposter syndrome and all that. You know, I, I still have imposter syndrome now in terms of like business, right? You know, I, I have my sweet business and my podcast I do and I still think, oh God, I don't think I'm... Don't think I'm doing enough, and surely people are going to find out that I'm, you know, God, they're doing so much better. I, oh, I still have that, and that's the kind of thing that I'm working on now. So, how old are you now? Just for 31 now, 31 now, uh, nearly 32. Do you feel like in the last six months there's been a sort of shift in your perspective of everything as if you've landed out of something? Yes, so it's so this is why it's weird you say that. Like, honestly, I I wouldn't think about life that much before. Like I would think about life, but I would think about life in a very kind of selfish way. So I would think, how am I feeling? Uh, what am I going to do? Am I going to do this? And then what switched differently is like, I, I, a lot of thought about meaning and purpose. Like, why are we here? What is the, what is the point of this? You know, I used to be so into buying like really expensive brands it was a brand but now i'm like well what's the point of buying that brand when you can just buy a t-shirt which is from the same place it just doesn't got a brand lots of different switches in this mm -hmm. and lots more uh, incredibly more empathetic more caring and that has all switched over this period of whatever four years and i would probably say that right now i'm probably in the happiest place and best place i've ever been because i'm just comfortable with who i am but also that was a necessary process for you to navigate in order for you to come out of this side and be like okay that was shaping me in some way and has taught me X, Y, and Z. Did you have that? Oh my God, it was awful. Like, similar to you, I was in the show and that was just hectic. And I think it was also very reflective of like who we were as people that was, we were people pleasers. Yeah. We wanted to like entertain, we wanted to be loved and by everyone and validated. So there was definitely like a lot I got out of it from an ego perspective, but it never felt authentic to like who I truly was and it yeah. never felt grounding. Uh -huh. And it didn't feel like, the energy of it was right for me. And then I went on this sort of like quest for self in a way and got so lost along the way. And when I ended up in LA, that was when I first kind of learned discipline. Like someone came into my life and actually I became like very disciplined. But part of that process was like a social exile that happened. Like I cut myself off from so many people because I didn't trust myself to go into that environment and not perform. Like you say, ah, so like you, I was you like, cut yourself up. Okay. Yeah, because I was like, I can't go into that situation and not be triggered and go back to like the way the chameleon person that I always am, because that had been my strategy for like my entire twenties, and it was so conditioned and set that I didn't know how to like be, how to be normal in my yeah. state and in those different environments. I was like, that made me feel anxious. But what's interesting about it, Joe, is that you forced yourself to change. I didn't, I gritted my teeth and tried to keep doing it until I was forced to. Well, I think I forced myself to change, but also there was circumstantially stuff happening that was forcing me to as well. I was suffering as a consequence every time I abandoned myself. And suddenly it got to a point where I was like, again, a, a thing of loneliness, like who are my real friends who really know who I am? Do I even really know who I am? Mm -hmm. Because my entire life has been based off like, be whoever you need to be to, be, to fit in and to be loved. That's exactly it. That's yeah. exactly it. Which I think is like, there's nothing wrong with that. And when we're young, when we're in our like teenage years and we're like figuring out our identity in a way for the first time, it's quite a normal thing to be like, well, I just want to be liked by everybody. Mm. And it's been over the last like year that I actually feel like, okay, I know what stability is. I know what grounding is. I know how to always come back to my center. But that's something that wasn't innate in me, unfortunately. Mm. It's something that I had to, to learn and develop. It's so interesting you say that because basically that's, that's exactly the sort of saying that I felt 
like I, I definitely, I, felt, I had no idea about balance. I didn't understand balance or what balance was. And, and actually I, I still struggle with balance a lot of the time in lots of different ways. But I, I'm in a relationship now, right? With someone who I just think is epic in every single way. Um, but I had convinced myself that uh, any relationship I went into, I was always going, I was just going to be settling. And actually what I was going to do is I was probably going to be looking other, elsewhere and, and perhaps you cheat or you misbehave, or you do the thing. So that's what happens because you, the, this idea of a soulmate and living in a balanced life, I didn't think you could balance the two. I thought it was impossible to do that. What, you didn't think you could actually bring your true self into the relationship? I thought that, yeah, I thought that you couldn't find someone who was compatible enough in order to make both work. And then I found my girlfriend and it couldn't be more balanced. In every, it's like, it's, it's unbelievably great how balanced it is. But with you, Kate, you're, you were great because you made decisions to help yourself quite early on. I didn't do that. I made decisions that actually hindered me and made me feel worse. It's the past six months to a year like you where I've just suddenly just like realized stuff. But some things for good and some things for bad. Like I still struggle with the me, like the, the sort of idea what of meaning. What things for bad? Well, so Blake wrote these two poems, Innocence and Experience, and says how innocence is destroyed by experience. But for me, the, recently what's happened is the great, the great thing that's happened recently that I've learned a lot about myself, but the, the tricky thing that I had is that I then started to question meaning about life. What is the meaning of this? Why are we here? What are we doing here? And actually the problem with that is that then everything that I used to really love, I then, Anymore. I didn't. I was like, well, don't really like that anymore. And so then I was like, well, then what excites me? And then I got myself into a hole where I was like, well, nothing excites me. Mm. So I'm going from this really driven, energetic guy at the beginning of this year to going like, well, nothing really excites me because well, what's, what's, the, motivating what's, me the, what's the point of everything? And so that's what, and so I had to struggle with that for a little bit. But I think, as you said, what's so interesting with Saturn Returns is that that's what you have to go through in order to come out the other side to understand everything. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like your innocence has been broken by your experiences? I, I think so. I think it, that happens, unfortunately, with everyone. It's really interesting that you that that's something that bothers you. Yeah, it really bothers It bothers me so much. But then I kind of come around to it that I'm like, well, all these experiences, like, craft who you are. I like this analogy of, like, is it, if we're a piece of clay yeah. and then... The pain and the experiences is like the knife that sculpts the clay. So it's like all that stuff you is a necessary process that you have to go through in order to become something beautiful, rather than it being something that ruins something that you are. Yeah, so I totally agree with you, right? But the problem is, is that you you've had to you've had to get the scars and the scrapes and things in order to get to that beautiful place. Where at the beginning you were already beautiful. I think what experience does to us is make us anxious and make us question things and make us not trust people and make us feel socially awkward at times and make us uh, question our own abilities. I completely agree and mm. I've found that challenging myself but now I try and go into it's like even the bad experiences let's say again like you go through a heartbreak and yeah. it's very hard not to carry that into the next experience but I think it's one of the, the great challenges of life mm -hmm. to be able to like fully experience that to process it and then let it go and go in with a curious and playful mind into everything. Yeah, and it, you know, experience is like a necessity because it, it's like survival, right? Mm. Um, you know, if you, were, if you were innocent, always you'd be killed by the predator. Like, you know, you go through a breakup, it's the worst thing in the entire world, you think you're gonna die, you can't breathe. You know, you do that wicked thing where you beg. For a girl who broke up, <laughs> Jesus. First girl who broke up, I mean, I remember I was on my hands and knees and my like <laughs> teardrops are landing on her feet. And I was like, this is low. And like, so you realize, so you learn from all of that. And that's quite cool. Because then you realize, actually, wait, hang on. You do get over it, even though it's so painful. So that experience is really good. I think the experience which is bad is that you realize that your parents aren't always right. And I kind of wish that my parents were right. <laughs> And the moment when your <laughs> when your parents get taken off the pedestal for like God, I like know. Ages, you realise they're humans. I mean, what age did that happen for you? I think mine happened quite late. Uh, yeah. I think mine was like. See, mine happened at fifteen. It was mine happened. I think twenty. I think mm. mine was quite late. Us. Yeah, but on the flip side of that, and this is something that I'm really trying to practice because I would always give so much value in other people's opinions, especially my parents, especially my mum. And other people around me and always like ask, like, what should I do about this? What should I do about this? And now I'm really like, okay, personal sovereignty here. Like, 
what do I feel intuitively about this? Because we know, we know instinctively and intuitively what is right for us, I believe. Mm -hmm. It's just about being able to tap into that and like quieting out the noise mm -hmm. and everything around you and just being like, what is my body telling me? Yeah, see, I think that's a, that's a good, I tell you what I've uh, learned recently, which is like a complete game changer for me, is that I would, uh, if I didn't sleep one night, let's say, let's have a bad night's yeah. sleep, I would I'm go. I'm not gonna sleep for a week. Yeah, I'm not gonna sleep for a week. Oh my God, I'm not gonna sleep for a week. I'm never gonna sleep. Oh my God, that means I'm never gonna sleep. My girlfriend's gonna break up. It means I'm never gonna get married. And, you know, <laughs> literally. Spiraling. And that happens within like three seconds and suddenly like, oh, my head pops. Like that's yeah. literally like. Yeah, yeah, I can relate to that. So I would catastrophize everything. And what I've worked out recently is that you feel anxious. Instead of grabbing hold of it, you brush it with a feather. You go, yeah, okay, I'm anxious, whatever. We know it's going to go fine. And so with everything, that's what I kind of do now. And it's actually really helped me rather than before I would just, ah. Well, you over-identify with the thought and let it grow into this, like, monster. And then before you know it, like, life is unbearable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the moment, the main things that I am, like, personally practising yeah. are being present okay because i realized that i lived most of my life in the past or in the future even in like the most amazing places in the world i'm anticipating like what's going to happen next or like thinking about something in the past whereas now i'm just like just be present in this moment most people do that you know they're, they're, that's what, what I, living, yeah, yeah they just do that they get and like, again like what you just said about your experience it takes like a, a discipline and consideration to actually you know do that and rewire your mind in some way and then the other thing is also just to like to flow with things and be, just to be fluid because you just don't know. Again, it's the same thing when my linear mind goes, okay, this has happened and then that will happen and then this will happen. Even if it's in a good way, I'm like, okay, that, that's that's the path. That's what we're doing. Okay, great, I can handle that. And then something takes you off course and it's like, no! <laughs> and it just like completely has a meltdown. Whereas now I'm like, okay. And one of my best friends tells me this, she, even when things are going really wrong, and I, I was telling her the other day, she was like, just say thank you. And I was like, Shut up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I say thank you. No, you. And we like joked about it, but it's like you just say thank you to the universe because it's just like taking you on a different course that will redirect you somewhere that's probably better than where you thought you were heading. You just have to be like malleable with it. Yeah. And go. So those are the things that I'm trying to like work with at the moment because I used to become very like just not move. And then things would get bad. Then things like the depression would come in, the anxiety, because I would just be in a state, state of like paralysis because mm. I'd be like, okay, this isn't going the way I wanted to. I'm going to try and force it. And then that doesn't work. And I'm just not going to make a move at all. Mm. Whereas now I'm like, okay, that was shit. Let's process that. Let's like be with it and fully accept it. And then like, let's move. That's it. It's being with it. That's exactly yeah. it, not panicking. And I think that was my biggest lesson as well also you know I, I think may you did that and i think a lot of listeners probably do the same is that when you have all these thoughts going in your head you know you have thousands thousands of thoughts a second you would always pick out the negative thoughts straight away so oh, yeah. or think the worst case scenario yeah, yeah, yeah. if something feels uncertain yeah but i think it's hard because you i just never realized that you had to train your brain in order to well it's a muscle yeah but i never thought that i thought that was a load of horseshit yeah. would you say that you're in a much happier place than you've ever been and yeah. do you put that down to the fact that you think it was Saturn go putting you through your paces and then you coming out the other side understanding yourself? Yeah. You do? Totally. And the thing is, I've had, like... I went on holiday recently with... There was a scientist there who was obviously super critical of all of this and didn't buy into it at all. But at the end of the day, it's a bit like religion. If that provides, like, a framework that mm -hmm. allows you to navigate your way through life then that's great, you know? And I take it all with a pinch of salt, but I believe that that was like what the process that I went through, whether you believe it, it's in astrology or not, is kind of irrelevant. But I just like that as like an arcing feature that allows me to think, okay, like bigger things are at play, but it's a dance between the two of us. We don't lose free will just because like Mercury's in retrograde, but we can like be in communication with something a little greater than ourselves, which I think is a beautiful thing. But do you, do you also think that perhaps it's a way to blame things on as well? Well, this is what I mean. I so think some people take it too far it, right? and they can be like, Mercury's in retrograde or like, this is happening. This is why I feel like this way or this is why it's happening, yeah. yeah. 
this is a communication between these two worlds, I believe, like your internal world and the external. It doesn't take away your personal responsibility just because like bigger things are at play. There's stuff that we just don't understand, but we are personally responsible for ourselves and the way we show up in life, in relationship, in friendship, in our career. It's all down to us ultimately. And I think a lot of people negate that. They don't want to take ownership over their life. Mm. They also like go into relationship being like, you're responsible for my happiness, but like no one is really. Mm. And these are things that I'm really like coming to terms with and actually just being more measured about stuff. At the end of the day, I sort of had to sit back and realise that actually, you know, I spoke to this guy who, um, he worked at Goldman Sachs and he was earning a lot of money um, and he wasn't too happy. And he went to Thailand on a trip, went to Thailand and he was on a bus. And this American guy got on the bus and sat down next to him and he was like, God, I just wanted to sit by myself and just not talk to anyone. And the American guy said, hey, how are you doing? He said, yeah, I'm good. He said, uh, what are you, what's your name? He said, his name. He said, what do you do? He says, I work at Goldman Sachs. And he says, as well, as a banker? He goes, yeah, as a banker. The guy said, well, you must be pretty wealthy. He says, yeah, I'm, do you know what? I earn a lot of money. I do. He says, are you happy? He says, do you know what? This way I went on this trip. I don't think I am happy. And he said, well, I'll give you the rocking chair technique. When you're sitting in a rocking chair and you look back at your life and you're 90 years old, are you going to be happy with what you've done? And he said, no, I don't think he said, are you going to remember the cars you bought, the houses that you bought, the holidays you went on? Are you going to remember the relationships and all the things you've done for other people? And he went, you're so right. And he got back, he quit Goldman Sachs. He set up a company, which is a coffee company. It's around London now called Change Please, where he hires homeless people for a year and houses them and helps them back on their feet. Couldn't be happier than anyone. And what I realized actually, that is if you're, forget all the business stuff that you're, go oh, these things. Actually, if you're a kind person and you're friendly and you, you're willing to help others, I think that's actually what means everything. Mm. We get sold this idea of like what success is and what happiness yes. is. And we just all chase this sort of, we're on this hedonic treadmill of more and more and more, like these things will make me happy. And you do come to a point where you realize like, that doesn't actually work for me. No, and also we have this like blueprint that we feel like we have to follow. So we have this blueprint where you go like, okay, I have to be married at 27 and I have to be earning a million pounds a year and I have to do this and I have to do that. And our blueprint doesn't go to plan because why would it? Because it's incredibly hard to do all those different things and it takes a lot of energy and stress and everything. So when we don't hit our blueprint, we start to freak out because we're like, well, we haven't got married and we haven't got the this and we haven't got that. And, oh my God. And actually there is no blueprint. So to tie that into what you mentioned a bit earlier about like purpose and meaning, do you feel like this is a big thing that's coming up for you right now? Yeah. Because obviously ostensibly like from the outside, even I have someone that know, knows you quite well, I think. A lot of what you say always surprises me because we do see things from like what we put out into the world. And mm. we're like, wow, that person's got this going, they've got that business, they've got this career, they've got that relationship, they've got that business. Yeah. And you just think they've got it all together. No. <laughs> <laughs> so treading water like a duck underneath. And and I mean, in terms like, look, God, if I when I was when I was 20 years old and I said I would be doing this when I am now, I would be like, get out of town. Because there are a lot of things that, I, that I've done and created, but... Um, which is amazing. Which is amazing. But I always thought that was going to bring happiness. And I can honestly say, and even though she's in the next door room, and I, I don't have to hear it, but uh, my true happiness has come from finding someone who I can just be homies with and just chill with and just have the best time. And that's what's brought in pure happiness and forget all the success and stuff for that. I would honestly give it all away to just go on a desert island and I'd be quite happy. Mm. Would I be happy? I might be a little bit happy, but you know what I mean? And I think that's what's so great. And so when it goes back to purpose and things like that, I honestly think purpose is about um, loving. The and quality of our relationships. Yeah, yeah. Whether would, that's friendship, friendship families. families. Yeah, mm. I think that's what it's about. And I'm the happiest, you know, I was building businesses, creating successful podcast doing it and I wasn't happy and I was on TV show getting TV show offers all these different things and I wasn't happy but having good friendships and being able to sit with you now and just feel so totally at ease having a great relationship with my girlfriend parents all that kind of stuff and now I'm happy and I think it's because that's what you meant to have these loving relationships and for me other people may be different but for me it's about being loved and feeling loved and being like a this sort of place I love that I do think, think so. it's like it's all been a necessary process that for you to come to that realization. Yeah, totally. And and it, you have to. So going back to your big, the reason why it's so interesting about Saturn returns is that without a doubt, I had to go through that process in order to get where I am now. And if I didn't, 
I would be one of those guys who are fucked every night, just going out <laughs> trying to hook up with chicks and being creepy as ever. And we saw that path. Yeah, it could have gone yeah, that way. And it's still good. It's still good. <laughs> but hopefully it won't. But it's it's interesting you say that that fuck life throws you fucking shit. Um, mm. It doesn't matter, you know, and my shit is nowhere near as bad as what other people's are. But it's relative but it's, to it's you. It's relative to me, exactly. But you get through it and you just have to be willing to learn, change and and move forward. And if you're willing to do those things, persistency in life is key. It doesn't matter if you're setting up a business, if you're in a relationship or you're trying to teach yourself more, you have to be persistent. If you're not persistent, you fall down. I heard this amazing quote once. Ease is a greater threat to success than hardship. Success isn't about being financially rich, it's about being fruitful in life in lots of ways. If something is easy, then you're never gonna succeed, really. Something has to be hard in order to succeed, because it's easy to just sit back and relax. So push your boundaries, learn about yourself, and you have to be willing to do that and be persistent in it, and then you will succeed. I just got a tingle. That was quite good, wasn't it? I love that. Yeah. Because like, I definitely think I was someone that would like just coast along life a little no bit. Point, and yeah. I'm realizing that. And it's the same sort of thing as like going with the flow and like when something tough happens, you're just like, okay, let's move. But just always continue to move and like at the same time be able to healthily process whatever you're experiencing. Totally. And also I just think what most important is is that naivety is your biggest weapon in everything. And this is what people don't realize. The reason why uh, my sweet business became somewhat of a success is because we had no fucking clue what we were doing. We made them gluten-free and vegan and made them colourful and made them really expensive. And people went, oh, this is sweet, just because we wanted to, right? And we just did that. In terms of our podcast, the reason why it was... Everyone said, you can't do a podcast with YouTube and just making people laugh. I'm never going to. You have to have a format. You have to do this. So there is no format. Like, whatever. We're just going to do it. And it worked. Because it's truthful to you. Totally. And I think that just... As much as taking advice from people and understanding things and, you know, whether it's about, you know, your own mental health, honestly, take advice from people and learn. But also at the same time, no one's going to have the answer for you. You have to kind of work it out yourself. Mm -hmm. And naivety is what will, what will get you there in the end. I think you can read as many books as you want and all these different things. But actually... But you've just got to try. You've got to try and you've got to be persistent. And you've got to, yeah, I think persistency is the biggest thing in life. Persistence is key. I remember Spencer always used to say that ironically. <laughs> but his was much more about alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> Drink more. And women. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Drink more, sleep with more women, and you'll be successful. <laughs> On that note, those are some very inspirational words from Jamie. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. I absolutely love this conversation, Thank and I you. think people are going to take away so much from it. Sorry to all the listeners I rambled. <laughs> no, it's I amazing. So many tangents. It's like the philosopher. I, isn't it? What? The, the, the next chapter. Yeah, of your life. should I close my book of notes now? <laughs> I hope you enjoyed listening to mine and Jamie's conversation. I felt that there is a lot of similarity between myself and him and, you know, this this people-pleasing thing that we both experienced of always wanting to be liked and loved. And I definitely feel, you know, as I've gone into my 30s that I'm kind of relax a little bit and then I have more of a fixed sense of self and it seems like so does he um, and he just had to go through some you know tricky things to navigate in getting there because I think the pressure that he put on himself to always like be 150 percent 24 7 just was like too much I also loved what he said about you know his tips for finding purpose and how that's ultimately for him about loving and the quality of our relationships is you know essentially what makes for a great life and also how we must remain inquisitive and persistent and naive in order to succeed, which I think is some very good advice. So you can find Jamie on Instagram at Jamie Lane and me at Kaggy's World. Saturn Returns is a Feast Collective production. The producer is Deborah Dudgeon and the executive producer is Kate Taylor. This podcast has grown through word of mouth, so please continue to share it with your friends or anyone you think might find it useful. It would also mean a lot if you are enjoying it to leave us a review on Apple. This helps us get discovered by more like-minded people. And please do check out our Saturn Returns with Kagi Patreon page, where I'll be sharing exclusive Saturn Returns content for the Saturn Returns community. Until next time, thank you so much for listening. And remember, you are not alone. Goodbye.